<clears throat> this program is called The Trade-Off. I'm here with Kevin McLaughlin, Austin Tech Entrepreneur. Thanks for being with us, Kevin. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. In this program, we are trying to look at the pros and cons of big financial decisions. Now, you're a, a tech entrepreneur now, but you hadn't always been. And <laughs> let's go back a few years. You're in your mid to late 20s. You're at a big tech firm, I think Fortune 100 company. And you've got, you've got a nice salary. They're sending you all over the world. You've got the pension lined up. You got a career path. Everything was there for you. But here you are now. You don't have an office. You don't have a, a salary that somebody else is paying you. You're on your own. Everything's on you. Um, I don't, at the risk of sounding like a dad here, what the heck were you thinking? Why did you think that was a good idea? Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, I was two years away from the house in Round Rock, right? I was right there. Um, so yeah, uh, how did I, how did I get here? Good question. Um, there were, there were a couple of things. Uh, I, when I was working for, I was working for Applied Materials, good company, large sort of older tech company, right? Established in the seventies, right? Um, and for me, my reason for leaving was I, I had a little startup inside of Applied Materials. I had a team of about four or five developers that was working on an internal tool for, for Applied Materials. And so I was sort of oddly in this place where I was working in a bigger, older, you know, a little bit more bureaucratic company, but I was running kind of like a little, a little startup inside of that company, right? And uh, that was exciting to me. So it was, it was fun, right, to, to be running a development team. And so I knew I could do it. And so my sort of breakout plan was uh, I actually wasn't just going to go freelance and start my own company or anything like that. Uh, I started by uh, switching from a big, you know, 100 company, like you said, to a small startup. Uh, and when I did that, um, I worked up here in Austin and it was like two weeks in and I was kind of seeing what they were doing and I was like I could do this right like I, I was like I, I I think or let me put it this way like like I could do what they're doing I don't know if we're gonna be successful but I could do what they're doing right uh, and so a couple of years later that led to me uh, just based on my financial situation and where I was I couldn't do you know sort of where I was in my life turning 30, uh, I couldn't do um, the 22 year old strategy, which is go uh, live in your parents' basement and eat Doritos to start your company or something like that. Right? I couldn't do that. Uh, so I, I had to come up with a really kind of a, a middle of those two, which is, is there a way that I can make money uh, that is, uh, that gives me the flexibility and the time that I need to start uh, start the company part of it, right? The sort of traditional startup things that people do. Uh, I need a way to have enough time to bet while also making uh, enough money to live in Austin, Texas and remain married, basically. <laughs> so looking back on that decision, what were what was some of the, uh, I like to call it head trash, it was holding you back from pulling the trigger that now you look back and you say, you know, that probably wasn't as big a deal as I thought. Totally. Absolutely. So, um, gosh, I, I, you know, it sounds crazy, but it was student loans for me. I thought that I was in a much worse financial position than I was. That, that, that's just, I think, where it was is I, I got a master's degree that was not cheap. Um, I had, between me and my wife, we had combined $120,000 of student loans. And I just thought that that was like a crushing amount of debt. And the only responsible thing to do was to keep drawing my big company salary. Um, and and that, that was it. I, I needed the job security uh, to remain uh, solvent, I thought. Um, it turns out that that was not the case, right? Um, yeah. 
So this is what's fascinating. A lot of people I talk to, young people, have good careers, but they, are, they have the bug. They have the itch to do their own thing. The, the idea of the freedom involved with it, the potential financial upside is very attractive, but they have a hard time pulling the trigger. You found a bridge by way of using some technical skills and finding a market for those technical skills in, in the online community, yeah. which allowed you to generate some income to now work on the startup project you're currently pretty deep into. Right. How does somebody, how would you suggest somebody finds what type of technical skill is marketable enough to be able to pull that off? Yeah, uh, this is something my, the past three years of my life would not have been possible a decade ago, right? Um, and what I do is a very boring part of the internet. Uh, it's, well, I, I think I would best describe it as internet plumbing, right? It's Google Analytics and Tag Manager, very boring subject unless you're running a website and then you need it. Right. Um, and I, like I mentioned, I have a master's degree in electrical engineering. 100% of my income comes from being obsessed with Google Analytics for a weekend. Right. I, I mean, that is where all of my income comes from today is from going really deep on one of these very, you know, otherwise boring subjects. And it literally took a weekend. Right now I have some technical background, so, so that helps, right? But you, what I would say is if you're trying to replicate that strategy, you want to find something that is, uh, one, boring, right? Don't start a social network if you're trying to do what I'm doing, which is just how do we get this bridge from working from a, for a big company or even a startup here in Austin to running your own shop, right? Focus on uh, what you're actually trying to do, which is you're trying to make money without uh, dedicating while having the time left over to do whatever else you're interested in. So the way that I did that just in terms of tactical things is when I made this transition, I, I sat down with a spreadsheet and I went through what money do, well, how much money do I need to make in terms of cash flow to continue paying rent, continue paying my student loans, uh, not be eating Doritos, right? What money do I have to make every month to make that happen, right? And then go figure out how to do that just uh, as quickly as possible. I would say the thing that really made the difference for me is, you know, I was thinking about these things and trying to do it for myself for a long time, thinking about doing it. You need a two-month action plan, two-year action plan for that. Because if you just drag it out forever, then it'll just take too long, right? So you go on and you get a two month action plan. And the first step that I did that I thought was really helpful is I said on month one on my own, right? I'm going to make $3,000. And I'm gonna do that if I have to drive for Uber, I'm making $3,000 this month. And what that did, uh, I didn't have to drive for Uber, so that's great. Um, it it just gave me the confidence that I could do it, right? That's what you need to do is just set a goal and say by hook or by crook, I'm gonna make this much money and, and just do whatever you have to do to do that. You gotta learn how to hustle a little bit if you're used to the monthly salary coming in, that would say. So that's step one. You've, you've since discovered that there's actually a really big marketplace for technical services. Mm. How, how could somebody who, from the outside looking in observe that market to, to get a sense for what businesses are paying people for where there is an actual market to jump into? Absolutely. So this is where the internet just makes a huge difference. Uh, you can go to these platforms, right? And if you're starting out in consulting or whatever, you are going to use a Right. So I use Upwork. That was my entry point into all of this. But there are other ones available. I would say if you're interested in exploring what is it that I could do that could give me the money I'm interested in making while providing the freedom that I want, go look at these platforms and see what people are paying for. What I did is I went and I looked and I was like, Jesus, 
people who are doing Google Analytics work are making 125 bucks an hour, right? I was like, that's a lot of money, right? And so I just said, I said, I could do that, right? So go on there, find those things that people are doing, right? And, you know, don't be afraid. They don't have to start making $125 an hour. That's not going to happen month one, right? Uh, but look at it and see where those opportunities are. It's all public information today that's what's great about it is you can go and you can cruise upwork and see what are people paying for what are the services that people are paying for you'll find if you're an accountant working for a big accounting firm you will find what you could make on upwork just doing accounting right and take those things and either find you already know how to do or find one that you know i could learn how to do that and that's a great place to start when I quit my cushy job about 10 years ago, the scariest thing was, how do I find my first client? But that's not as hard as it used to be. Absolutely. This is the thing uh, that when I said, you know, my life over the past two years would not have been possible 10 years ago. If 10 years ago, if you were looking at building up a consulting service, you know, what I would have to do, I do this very, very small part of the internet right and i would basically have to go build up a clientele base essentially just in austin texas right and there's just not that many people who need what i offer in this geographic region uh, that i could get in touch with you know customer this is the, the the main thing that i've learned over the past two years is that customer acquisition isn't a business problem it's the business problem Right. And that is what these platforms provide you. So I see a lot of people complain, you know, Upwork, it's kind of annoying to use. That's true. It charges 20%. But the truth is what they're doing for you is aggregating demand. They're giving you customers. That's part of businesses. So before I think it would have taken me two years to build up the kind of client base that I have today. Um, that I had in month one, right? Uh, my first client on Upwork was actually a company in Australia, right? And that's what the internet gives you is just this reach. A lot of people talk about the internet, they talk about uh, scale and it's cliche to say that the internet provides you scale, of course, right? Um, and it's just true, but usually what people think about is hyperscaled companies like Facebook or Google, right? But it also provides you this scale as a freelancer, uh, a very, very small, as small business as you can get, one person shop providing one service. What it gives you is the scale to reach anyone who needs your services. And that just totally changes the game for this kind of stuff. You can get up and running very, very quickly on these sorts of things. Now there's some strategies and tactics that I think uh, you have to implement to do that, right? Uh, but the, the, the size of the market is today uh, big enough to support whatever lifestyle you're interested in. Once you got going, what did you learn about pricing your services? Yeah, I mean, I'm still learning how to my services. I don't think that that ever gets easier. Um, but I would say, you know, with, with the, the, the pricing, he is in freelancing, it's always tempting to pull back to a sort of hourly rate, right? Now I have a listed hourly rate on Upwork and I do hourly work. I think, I think that that's, you know, that's an important part of what I do, but where you really start to make good money, right? The kind of money that you want with the flexibility that you're interested in is when you productize yourself. So you have to understand you, you know, throughout the past two years, I've built up essentially intellectual property about how to execute on these projects quickly. And those projects have not become less valuable to my clients. So the fact it would take me 30 hours to do something two years ago, but it takes me 30 seconds today, doesn't make it any less valuable to the client. And so what that means is you wanna to try to index the price, not to your sort of cost plus your model, where you're saying it's my labor plus a little bit extra. You wanna index it to 
the value that you're providing to the, to the client, to the customer. And what you'll find is uh, there's broadly two types of clients, people who agree with that premise and what they want is a job well done and they don't care how you do it or how long it takes you to do it. And clients who um, are not that, <laughs> let's say, let's, let's be generous, right? And they're cheaper, right? And as you develop and you become more of an expert and you learn whatever market you're in, you'll be able to differentiate between those two types of clients and you will just start exclusively working for the former. And that's where you're in a great business because your clients are happy. You're just motivated to serve them well. That's all they're interested in. They don't, they're not interested in tracking your hours or anything. They don't care. They want a job done. They want it done well. And you can do that. And once you're there, then, then that's when you know you're really starting to find track on, on this sort of freelancing business model. Contrast your lifestyle now versus what it probably would have been at the big firm with the golden handcuffs. Yeah, you know, this is interesting. Um, it's, it's an interesting time to talk about this because I'm a month away from having my first kid, right? And I feel the desire for security, right? I feel that probably more than I ever have in my life. The, the desire to just be able to take parental leave for a two months and not worry about it and know that the same monthly income is going to come in. Right. And I feel how, I mean, that's like a black hole of, of, of uh, just sort of pulling you in. Right. And that would be really nice right now. Uh, to be, I, I would, I would feel better about that. I, right. Um, I would feel more confident going into parenthood. That would be something. Right. But at the same time, you know, this was, this was, I guess, like the, the shift for me in terms of security was some of that is illusory. Um, a big company can always fire you. And if you've been working for that big company for 20 years, you are, this is nothing against these companies. Uh, this is just the way big companies have to operate. Um, you are good at working for that company. That's what you're good at doing, right? So the guys who are working for Applied Materials, you know, they've been working there for 20 years. It's a nice life, right? Uh, it really, really is, right? You go to work, you get good at a job, uh, you're doing something, you're building something, um, you get to travel to Taiwan once a year, stuff like that, right? That's all great. Uh, but if you're worried about security, someday they're going to let you go. And what are you going to do then? right? And now you're going to be 45. And, you know, this is at least my thought process. Everybody's different. But my thought process was, I work here for the next 20 years, and they let me go. I'm going to be 45. I'm going to have kids, right, uh, running around, uh, hopefully. And, you know, I'm going to be good at working for applied materials. That's what I'm going to be good at. And I don't know how to translate that into making money somewhere else, right? And so there's a little bit of a loser that security is illusory, even though day to day, moment to moment, uh, it feels nice, right? So I, I always sort of think about it as like, when you're working for a big company, you're stacking all the risk at the end. It's all tail risk, but it's over your lifetime. So it's probably gonna happen at some point. Whereas when you go into freelancing, you're living with that risk every day, every month. Are we going to make enough money this month? Is it going to, that's scary, but you're confronting with it. You're confronting a smaller amount of risk daily instead of a large amount of risk, you know, very much at the tail. And so that's part of it. But, you know, psychologically, yeah, it'd be a lot nicer to be, uh, to be right now know that I had a monthly salary that wasn't going to change even if I took two months off to hang out with my newborn, right? Last question for you. What would you say is the minimum skill stack to be successful working independently like you are? What are, what are the 
two, maybe say three skills that working together give you pretty good odds of success? When you're a freelancer, you're the whole company, which means you are both sales, marketing, and product. And it's really hard if you were an incredible developer, like, you know, you're a great coder and you're the best world, you are the world's best JavaScript developer, then maybe that's all you need. You just need to be that good at one thing. Really hard to be that good at one thing, right? But if you are, maybe even go sell your services to the highest bidder because you're just that good. Um, there are people like that. I totally get it. Uh, but if you're not that, the second skill that I would say you need on your list is communication because you need to be able to communicate to customers what it is you're going to do for them and why they should pay you whatever it is uh, you need them to pay you to do it, right? And most of my, you know, when I started off, there's a couple of technical learn about Google Analytics and things like that. Um, but once, you sort of, once I sort of got those things, everything since then has been about figuring out pricing, which is really about communicating to your customers uh, the value that you're going to provide them, right? And getting a system in place to communicate well with customers. That's also a hard part. So I would say, one, whatever it is you're selling, right? If you're an artist, right? Uh, so something totally, totally different uh, than what I do. Uh, let's say you're an artist. Okay, get good enough at that thing to provide value to your customers, whatever, however you're gonna monetize that, if it's design or something like that, then you've gotta be able to communicate to those people both in a sales sense and in a what value you're providing. And then, you know, then there's the minor stuff that you need to learn about running a business, like how to just make sure that you're filing your taxes correctly. But all that comes later, right? That's all, that's all post revenue. So first you got to make money, which is why I say start by just trying to make $3,000 this month, right? Just try to do it. And then you'll figure out the rest of it. Um, but skill stack, yeah, whatever it is you're selling, and then how to, how to sell it. That would be it. You've used your independence to focus time, energy on a startup, something you long wanted to do. Tell us a little bit about that startup and then uh, finish up with how people can find you. Absolutely. So, uh, so I do the freelancing business. I call that the keep the lights on business, right? That's how we make enough money to live here. Right. Uh, and that takes me, you know, 10, 10, 15 hours a week. Right. Which means I have this chunk of time, 30 to 35 hours a week, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less to invest in uh, this startup, which is uh, it's a CRM for nonprofits. And this is a good thing about freelance is the way I came up with that idea is a lot of my consulting clients are nonprofits and I have this gap. Right, and that's the thing about just going in and working for yourself. You start to realize the gaps, right? And so, uh, so we're building a program for nonprofits. Uh, we're building it from the ground up uh, to really work and uh, integrate with existing tools, right? Uh, so you could keep your Mailchimp and your Stripe or your PayPal, whatever you're using for payments, and you don't need to overhaul everything uh, to be able to start using a CRM, right? And uh, so. We're working on that. Um, it's going really well. You know, we're able to invest the kind of time that we need to make uh, a startup like that, which is very different than freelancing, happen, right? Um, and so uh, going well, we're getting clients. Uh, we're working through very early product development, but discovering a lot of interesting things as we go. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, that's, that's an advantage that, that was the plan was to sort of bridge from working for a company to owning uh, a startup. And I'm kind of somewhere in the middle of that bridge right now, but you know, hopefully walking in the right direction. People can find me at sliderulotech.com. That's my uh, website where I have all of the, the uh, services that I do. And then uh, it's also linked to our CRM. So if you're interested in starting a CRM, uh, getting up and running quickly, uh, you can check us out there. Kevin, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me.